Welcome back. Particle kinematics is about the geometry of the motion of particles and bodies in space. Kinematics is part of dynamics, and the other part of dynamics is kinetics. And kinetics is about the relationship between forces acting on bodies, their masses, and the resulting motions. Today we're going to focus on particle kinematics, though some of the ideas that we introduce we won't really need until we get to continuum mechanics. Now we'll consider three types of motion. A rectilinear motion, which means motions in a straight line, or essentially one-dimensional motions. Curvilinear motion, which means motions in three-dimensional space. And angular motion, which are also curvilinear motions in three-dimensional space, but represented by radii and angles. So let's start by reviewing position, displacement, and velocity. So the point P at time t is moving so that it's at point P prime at time t plus delta t. Its position at point P is denoted by the position vector capital X and at time t plus delta t by position vector little x. The displacement vector u is the difference between little x and big x, and for small displacements we'll label this delta x. Therefore, the velocity vector v is the limit as delta x tends to zero of delta x over delta t, which is dx dt, or x dot. So here's the velocity vector, which is tangent to the point of the arc of the motion at point P at time T. Now we can define acceleration. So again, at time T we have point P, at time T plus delta T, the particles at point P prime, the velocity vector at time T is V, and at time T plus delta T is V plus delta V. The position vector is little x at P, and the velocity vector is v, so the acceleration vector a is the limit as delta t tends to zero of delta v over delta t, which is dv dt, or v dot, or x double dot. So for this motion, the acceleration vector is shown in red. Note that the acceleration vector has components tangent to the motion and normal to the motion. Now, often in kinematics, we have to solve problems for velocity and displacement by integrating the, an expression for acceleration that we often solve for, and if it's a problem in kinetics, using forces. So let's consider the 1D rectilinear case where x, v, and a now reduce to scalars, the, if you like, the x component in a one-dimensional motion. So in the case when a is a function of t, then a of t is v dv dt, which means dv equals a dt. So if we want to integrate this for velocity, then the integral between v naught and v of dv would be the integral between 0 and t of a of t d with respect to t. Now if a is a function of x, then again we can make use of the fact that a is equal to dv dt and v equals dx dt. And if we compute v dv and expand that using the chain rule, we would get v dv dx dx, which would be v dv dt dt dx dx. But dt dx is 1 over v, so that cancels with v leaving us dv dt, which is a dx. So integrating this, we would get that the velocity of v is the integral from v naught to v of v dv is equal to the integral from x naught to x of a of x dx. So this is when we have acceleration as a function of x. If we have acceleration as a function of v, we can do something similar. Again, we make use of the fact that dv dt is equal to a, now a function of v. 
which gives us that dv over a of v is equal to dt, and integrating that gives us that the integral from v0 to v of dv over a of v is equal to the integral from t0 to t of dt. Or alternatively, we can make use of the fact that dv dt equals dv dx times dx dt, which equals v dv dx, and integrate this to obtain that the integral from x0 to x of dx equals the integral from v0 to v of v dv over a of x. So these are some useful ways to make use of the definitions of this velocity and acceleration to integrate accelerations to obtain velocities and positions for different problems. Now, sometimes it's important to distinguish between a description of the motion as seen by a fixed observer versus a description of the motion as seen by a material or moving observer or from the point of view of the moving particle. So the former is called a material or Lagrangian description of the motion. For example, if we were to write the displacement u as a function of capital X, which was the original position of the point, and t, then this would be a Lagrangian description of the motion. And so expanding that, we would get little x of big X and t minus big X. We call this a material or Lagrangian position where big X represents the original point of a particle because all particles in the system only have one original point. And so by writing things as a function of its original position, you're following the particle. An alternative equally valid way of writing the displacement would be to use a spatial or Eulerian description of the motion where u of little x and t is equal to little x minus big X of x and t. This is a spatial description of the motion because now things are written as a function of the point in space and different particles are occupying that point at different times. Similarly, we could write a Lagrangian or Eulerian definition of velocity. For example, we could write velocity from the point of view of the moving particle, which would be v of big X and t, or d little x of big X and t dt, or velocity from the point of view of a fixed external observer, v of little x and t is d little x of x and t dt. So again, when we write a description of a motion as a function of original coordinates that label material particles, we call this a Lagrangian or material description. When we write a description of a motion as a function of spatial coordinates uh, through which different particles are passing at different times, this is the spatial or Eulerian view of a fixed observer. Time rates of change of physical quantities, including change of velocity, which is acceleration, when seen by the moving particle, can be different from the same quantity measured by a fixed spatial observer, because there could be relative accelerations between the particle and the observer. When we write the physical laws of mechanics, they need to be with respect to the physical particle, they apply to the particle, not the point in space that it occupies. And so to obtain these correct rates of change, we use a quantity called the material derivative, which computes time rates of change as seen by the moving particle in terms of the partial derivatives with respect to time as seen by a fixed spatial or Eulerian observer. So for example, the material velocity would be b as a function of big X and t, uh, and its spatial equivalent would be b hat of little x and t. So the material, so the material description of the acceleration vector a of big X and t is the material derivative of the velocity vector big D v big D t, which is the partial derivative of v of big X and t with respect to t. 
which we can then evaluate in terms of v hat using the chain rule, which gives us del v hat of little x and t del x1 times del x1 of big X and t del t plus del v hat of little x and t del x2 times del x2 of big X and t del t plus del v hat of little x and t del x3 times del x3 of big X and t del t plus del v hat of little x and t del t. So the Lagrangian or material expression for the acceleration as seen by the moving particle a of big X and t or v dot of big X and t written in terms of the spatial view would be v hat dot grad v plus del v hat del t. So you can see that the difference between the acceleration as seen by the moving particle and the acceleration as seen by the fixed observer is this relative acceleration v hat dot grad v which depends not on time rates of change of velocity but on spatial differences in velocity. So different particles moving at different speeds will give a fixed observer a different measure of acceleration than a moving uh, particle. And it's the acceleration as seen by the moving particle that's the one that determines its inertial force and physical quantities. The material derivative is something that we'll come back to when we um, move to continuum mechanics. Now let's consider a curvilinear motion and resolve the tangential and normal components of the acceleration. This requires a little bit of differential geometry and the key trick here is to an imagine to create a parameter s that you can think of of the arc length that varies continuously along the trajectory of the moving particle. We can define ds, the length of any segment along the trajectory, using Pythagoras. So ds squared equals dx1 squared plus dx2 squared plus dx3 squared, or in vector notation, dx dot dx. Therefore, ds is equal to the square root of dx dot dx. So all we really need to know is that this relationship can be found and exists. The velocity, which is dx dt, or x dot, could therefore by the chain rule be written as dx ds ds dt. Now dx ds is the vector normalized by its length, so it's a unit vector along the tangent of the uh, motion, so that's e sub t, and ds dt is just the magnitude of the velocity component along the uh, tangent direction, so it's the magnitude of the velocity vector. Therefore, the acceleration dv dt is d dt of ds dt times the unit vector tangent vector et, which equals, therefore, by the chain rule, d2 s dt squared times e sub t plus d s dt times d e t dt. This further expands to d2 s dt squared times e t, the tangent vector, plus d s dt times d e t d s times d s d t, which therefore gives us d2 s d t squared times e t plus d e t d s times d s d t squared. Now we won't prove it, but d e t d s, the derivative of the tangent vector with respect to the arc length, is actually the normal vector divided by the radius of curvature. So this gives us d2 s dt squared times et plus en over rho times ds dt all squared. Therefore, the tangent component 
of the acceleration is d2s dt squared or dv dt where v here is the magnitude of the velocity vector and the normal component of the acceleration is 1 over rho times ds dt squared or the magnitude of the velocity squared divided by rho. So that gives us that the acceleration vector has tangent component d magnitude of v dt and normal component magnitude of v squared over rho.